Dear listeners, this is the third part of this story. If you haven't seen the past parts, we recommend you watch them first. The phone rang and pulled me out of the clingy embrace of sleep. I lay awake for a while, and the phone rang and rang. I fumbled with my hand on the bedside table and finally pressed the green button. Hello? Who is it? Hello? There's a call for you from the city hospital emergency room. Your wife was brought in an hour ago in a very serious condition. Can you come over now? My wife? I didn't realize it was Natasha. But she and I are divorced. I don't know, but your number is in her phone as her husband. Your wife is in the operating room on the second floor. So you'll be there? Yes. I'm on my way. I almost ran up to the second floor. Doctor. What happened to her? She's badly beaten with a broken arm, collarbone, and some ribs. Yes. And she was raped. I'll be more specific later. The doctor looked at me suspiciously. You two live together. She left me over the summer and now lives with another man. I think I understood why the doctor looked at me so suspiciously. You think I beat her and raped her? It's not my business to make any assumptions. Let the police sort it out. The doctor took off his glasses and wiped them with the hem of his robe. She was picked up by an ambulance called by the neighbors. She was almost naked and covered in blood. The police are coming to take care of her. Doctor. Is she conscious? Can I talk to her? My mouth was dry with excitement. She's unconscious, but she keeps asking for some euro. There's another question. The doctor took off his glasses again. She needs an operation. A broken rib has punctured a lung. It's a complicated operation and the doctor hesitated for a second. Anyway, it costs money. We have free medical care. That's true, but you know what I mean. Drugs? There's a difference between the budget version and the non-budget version. Rehabilitation again. How much? I was tired of listening to the doctor's verbiage. The doctor took a notebook from his pocket and wrote a five-digit number. This is in dollars. He explained. Operation. The money will be there by noon today. The doctor nodded his head. I dialed my son's number and briefly told him everything without any shocking details. I asked him to call his sister and come to the hospital. The police arrived. I was tortured for a long time, but in the end, they left me alone, convinced that I had a solid alibi. The hotel clerk confirmed that I had been in my room all night and had only left after the call from the hospital. I looked at my watch. It was half past seven in the morning. There wasn't much time. I thought for a while and dialed the number of my editor. Good morning. It's Yuri. Tell me if I can get in advance for a book I haven't written yet. I'm having problems with Yuri. The editor interrupted me. How much do you need? I told you well, it's almost half your fee. I think we can solve that problem. Come to the editor's office at 8 o'clock. I felt a little better. I returned to the hotel at half past 8, quickly changed my clothes called Jun and cancelled all my business for the day. It seemed to me that she was not surprised. At the editorial office, everything was solved quickly. The lawyers drew up a contract and transferred the money to me. I immediately called the hospital and five minutes later dumped the required amount into her account. Refusing the offered coffee. I went to see Natasha. Well, what can I say? The operation was quite successful. I think that soon your wife will be on the mend. The doctor looked at me intently again. She told the police she fell down the stairs. Can I go to her? Yes, but not for long. She's still very weak from the anesthesia. Natasha was lying covered in a sheet tangled in tubes and wires. When I came in, she looked at me and tears welled up in her eyes. She moved her lips trying to tell me something. I stroked her hand. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. Natasha tried to smile with the corners of her chapped lips. I practically checked myself into the hospital. 
They put a couch in her room, and I spent all my time with Atasha. I washed her with a sponge, changed her underwear, and spoon-fed her. Her body was one big bruise. On her breasts, I saw strange burns. It looked like someone had burned her with cigarettes. All this time, we hardly spoke. She tried to make small talk, but I ducked under any pretext. I had nothing to talk to her about. At one time, we said everything to each other. The children helped my daughter came very often to replace me and give me some time to rest. My son didn't forget his mother either. I even began to think that we were a family again, like before, but it only seemed. You can't step into the same river twice. After about a month and a half Natasha began to walk a little. At first, she started walking down the hospital corridor, and then she started going out to the park. And two weeks later Natasha was discharged from the hospital. She didn't need my help anymore. Before I left, I handed Natasha a blue folder with the documents for her apartment and the keys. She didn't immediately understand what was going on and looked at me in surprise. I managed to buy your apartment and put it back in your name. She tried to tell me something, but instead of words, she burst into tears. Without another word, I turned and left. I had to make an effort not to turn around. A man will never forgive the betrayal of the woman he loves. Treason, there is no statute of limitations. And I loved her too much to forgive. All this time I was tormented by one question. What really happened? Natasha flatly refused to tell me so I decided to do it myself. I sat in her yard, talked to the neighbors and collected a picture of what had happened. After a month of living together, Natasha and her promising artist realized that this mass alliance was not going to end well. As long as there was money, they still got along. But then the quarrels and scandals began. One day Natasha caught her lover in the company of two drunken friends. When she tried to drive them out of the house, her new husband explained her place accompanying the explanatory conversation with his fists. And then they raped her one at a time and all together. They mobbed her for a long time, extinguishing burning cigarettes on her breasts. To prevent the victim from escaping, they tied Natasha to a chair. But when they passed out in a drunken stupor, she managed to untangle the ropes and get out of the apartment. What happened next? I already knew. It made sense to me why her new husband never came to. See Natasha. Winter. Was inevitably coming. The last leaves were falling. Some fell almost vertically to the ground, while others were picked up by the wind and whirled around as if in a farewell dance. And sometimes it seemed to me that my fate was spinning in this autumn. Tango. Life sometimes brings strange surprises. As I learned, one of the bastards who raped Natasha soon killed himself by throwing himself out of his own kitchen window. The police as always were unable to determine the reason for such a desperate act. The other rapist was found in the morning in a noose. Everything was clear. He'd had a lot to drink the night before with his buddies. And that was it. Hangover syndrome. It was already deep into the night when I parked the car a block away from the house where the talented artist's studio was located. I pulled on my gloves and threw the hood of my jacket over my head and walked up to the entrance. An ordinary combination lock with a standard set of numbers. I went up to the right floor and took my time. There were two apartments on the floor. I put gum on the peephole of my neighbor's door and out a bunch of lockpicks. Finding the right key was a matter of one minute. Likely picked at the keyhole, the lock clicked quietly and the door flew open. A standard apartment. Two adjoining rooms and a kitchen. I silently made my way into the room where the great painter slept on a crushed couch among easels and unfinished paintings. I could smell the smell of booze in. The musty air. Bohemhemia, I thought to myself, Natasha, didn't you see whom you were leaving for? My God, women, are you so blinded by passion? Leaning over, I should be artist by the shoulder. When he began to give signs of life, I punched him in the temple, knocked him out. When he woke up, he was surprised to find himself taped to a chair. 
surprise. You should have seen his eyes. Everything was there. But most of all, there was animal fear. I carefully, not an animal after all, ripped the tape off his mouth and pulled back his hood. I wanted to hear his voice. Did you recognize me? I spoke softly, but very convincingly. Don't. Don't. I didn't mean to. Forgive me. He also cracked almost in a whisper realizing that it was useless to shout. There was a peculiar smell. He seemed to be shitting himself with fear. What a poor guy. But this is also a signal to me. It's time to end it. I covered his mouth again and slowly drew my silenced pistol from my pocket after having disengaged the safety. The cartridge was already in the chamber, and I didn't have to pull the bolt. Then I put it into a plastic bag so I wouldn't have to look for the shell casing later. And with a practiced movement pointed it at the artist's head. I pulled the trigger slightly. The gun jerked going slightly upward and the bullet hit the right spot. I changed in the car, put my clothes, gun, and gloves in the bag. As I drove along the embankment, I stopped and got out. The moon was shining over the river. A silver trail of moonlight stretched across the water almost all the way to the shore. I threw a bag into the water. P.S. Three years had passed. My car raced down the highway, dispersing the light snow that had fallen overnight, leaving behind it a fast lingering trail. In five kilometers, the asphalt changed to dirt. During the night, a little caught up and the wheels crunchly broke the thin ice, which covered the puddles glistening in the dim autumn sun. The farther I drove, the narrow the road became. I slowed down and soon I was surrounded by a dense dense forest. So about eight more kilometers, and I was at my destination. The midday sun was in a haze and against it, the surrounding scenery was particularly sharp. The leaves on the were almost gone, and those that remained stood out as bright spots of red and yellow on the gray-green wall of the autumn forest. Around the next bend, a large lake opened. The road went almost right by the shore, and I could clearly see frothy waves like young lambs strolling across the wide water area. I lowered the window. A light breeze from the lake brought with it the smell of algae and dampness. The road turned sharply to the left and a large one-story house made of pine logs came into view. I parked the car near the boatshed, a sturdy Indian-style structure with wooden ornaments, and elk antlers blackened by time on the gable. I took a large bag out of the trunk and went up to the porch. A young woman came out to meet me holding a little boy by the hand. Hi. Is everything okay? Jen kissed me looking into my eyes. We were waiting for you. The little boy wrapped his arms around my leg. Daddy? Well, did you buy it? I took him in my arms. I bought it, baby. It's in the car. I held my son close to me. Let's get it together. The sun was shining brightly. The sky was almost clear, and its dazzling blue cut the eye.